Okay, good day everyone. I'm Broya. I'm the head of the Emergency and Disaster Management Department in the Tel Aviv University. And I'm happy and honored to open this webinar, which will focus on learning from the present COVID-19 crisis while looking at the future of disaster management. The current coronavirus uh, crisis presents a global challenge of which the international community has not had to deal with in the past years. Nonetheless, history has taught us that this is not the first time that the world has needed to cope with such a wide scope pandemic. Even before mankind had the ability to travel so easily from country to country, the viruses managed to do so, and the spread of varied diseases proved to be lethal to millions of people throughout the world. The present crisis in many ways requires us all to segregate, to be isolated, home quarantine. And some people wonder whether the world after the coronavirus will revert back to each country concentrated solely on its own population. I believe that the opposite is the case. We're all familiar with Francis Bacon's revelation that knowledge is power, information is power. Benjamin Franklin even went further stating that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. This is where we're all standing today, sharing information, viewing the past while looking at the future, studying the data that we can all collectively gather in order to plan together how to overcome challenges, analyze different consequences such as the medical, the social, economic, ethical, and more, and collaborate even more closely than before so as to enable us all to combat the current hazard, the coronavirus. Disaster management is a profession, and all of us here are part of the faculty in uh, uh, the Emergency and Disaster Management uh, uh, Department, and we would like to share knowledge, insights, uh, uh, discuss uh, different aspects with all of us today that have gathered here as now. On behalf of all of us in the Emergency and Disaster Management Program in the Tel Aviv University, I would like to thank you all for joining us today and for the joint opportunity to work together to combat the COVID-19. Our mutual support and solidarity makes us all stronger and more resilient. In the effort of discussing together questions that concern all of us and what we need to do and can do in order to bounce forward, we have with us today the following uh, uh, panelists. All of them faculty in the master's program of the emergency and disaster management to provide a multidisciplinary perspective. I would like to welcome Professor Mil Elkan. Mick will address medical and ethical uh, aspects. Uh, Professor Nava Haruvi, she will address the economic implications. Um, Mr. Gilly Shanhar will relate to risk communication, very channels of communication. Uh, we have Dr. Zohar uh, Rubinstein that will address uh, resilience and uh, mental health, and Dr. Uh, Moran Bodas, also part of the faculty, um, into very much uh, uh, studying uh, non-conventional uh, um, scenarios as well as disaster psychology. I would also like to uh, introduce you, even though we don't uh, see her, Ms. Orit Cody from our international uh, program, international school. Before we start, I would like to ask all of you to very quickly update us through uh, uh, the icon that you will be able uh, to press now to update us as to where you are based in the world. Marit, can you put uh, the poll? Thank you. Okay, I hope everyone had a chance to submit the response. Reed, can you share with us where we have participants from? We have 64% who voted and the most, so there's still a few more voters, but so far we have the most people um, from Europe attending our webinar currently uh, at fi almost 50%, 7% um, here, let me just share the results with you, 7, 8% from North America, Israel 21%, and a bit from Asia, um, India, and Africa. I wonder who's who's coming from other, but uh, we'll have to keep the keep guessing. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
So now that we know where you're coming from, I would like to just give you one more logistic uh, uh, information. Since we have an hour at our disposal, you have the opportunity to uh, ask elements that are important to you through the Q&A. You can see the icon Q&A, and we will be able to uh, uh, raise the different questions that interest uh, all of the attendees as much as the time will allow us. So I would like to uh, uh, refer the first question to Professor uh, Elkan. Mick, can you, uh, we've seen in the world now different models of managing uh, uh, COVID-19. Some focus on mass testing, others on uh, lockdown and so on. All are targeted to, to achieve the same goal of containing the coronavirus. Which model is actually proving to be more effective and why? But please unmute yourself. Thank you. This is a complex question. Uh, the, the issue with uh, the data that we see is uh, really erratic because uh, what we really miss is, is the denominator. And in order to see how frequent the infection is and how serious it is and how many people have died or will die of it, we need a denominator which we don't have. Now, even with widespread testing, uh, it all depends on who you test. Do you test anybody with fever? Do you test anybody who has come in contact with a patient? These are very serious issues. Uh, on the other hand, the solid data is the absolute numbers, not relative to population, not relative to anything, of seriously ill patients or fatalities. And in this sense, we can grade countries to the severity of the epidemic. However, there's a big issue there because all we can say is what is true today, we don't know about tomorrow. And this, I think, should be the mantra for our discussion because we really cannot tell what the future has in, uh, in the corona epidemic uh, still waiting for us. Thank you, Mick. And, and Mick spoke about the uncertainty. And Nava, I would like to uh, ask you about another issue of uncertainty. And that is, uh, what is the certainty or uncertainty concerning the economic consequences of the COVID-19? Are we actually heading to the worst recession that we have known uh, in the past decade? I'm afraid that it's the only certain thing in this situation that it won't be a recession. It will be a very big depression. It can't be otherwise uh, because uh, there will be a real scarcity of products. It's not anymore an economic bubble like it was in, um, in 2008. It's a real depression, a real scarcity of uh, products. Country can't produce products and people can't or even are not allowed to consume products. Not to say that they are not allowed to consume services. So the only thing that the government can, uh, can do is print money. But money without products has no value. Money will lose its value. The obvious forecast is obvious, is massive unemployment and inflation that usually don't go together in historical terms. And in future terms, they will go together. High unemployment, high unemployment, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and inflation, very high inflation rates. And it's a dangerous uh, combination of a uh, massive amount of money together with scarcity of physical products. We are now talking on physical products, not services anymore. Every go, everybody is going to the, to the store to buy food or to buy hygienic stuff or something like this. And most of us don't go now to, to make their hair or to, to get uh, their services. They are not allowed. So less products are produced people do not work and they can't import or export because global gates are closed. So you have to pay for fewer products while you are unemployed. So I can't say good news about this. I hope we'll have good use about medicine or immunization or something like it. But in economic, regarding economic situation, it's a very unpleasant situation where the, even the governments don't have any more uh, monetary tools to deal with high inflation 
because interest rates are so low. So uh, what will be is that we won't have products and also the shutdown in most countries devastate a special small business. Big business, they will have time to survive, but small business will be closed and they won't be, have the ability to recover, not without government assistance, which is very difficult to provide to, so, to very small business and a lot of gig workers. In, car, in countries where small business are very significant and where a gig economy is significant, like in Israel the, and, and in Europe and other countries uh, you come from, this means a medium to long, to long term unemployment because uh, even when shelter in place is removed, the job will not be there and there will be no return uh, with the current employers. So sorry, sorry to tell you that I am not a, a woman of a good news regarding the economic situation. It will take time, but let us survive and be healthy and then we'll, do, we'll deal with the economic uh, situation. So thank Gloria, you, Nava. Before yeah. you move on, sorry, we have some questions from the crowd um, which are related to what uh, Professor Haubi just spoke, if I may. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Marcella is asking, uh, how will governments be dealing with the increase in costs in pensions and unemployment benefits that uh, now need to be paid to unemployed uh, people around the world? And uh, there's an anonymous attendee who's asking, are there any opportunities out of this crisis? Yeah, yeah. many opportunities. Uh, I'll answer these two questions. First of all, uh, pensions... Uh, there will be a problem with future pensions. Uh, present pensions will, will, uh, will you will get present uh, pensions, but future pensions, I am not, I am not, I can't say you will have. So government will print money and print money and print money, and it will help in the short run, but not in the long run. So they hel will have to raise uh, taxes, but people don't have with what, with what to pay taxes, and I, I am sure there will be uh, some compulsory bonds that uh, governments will sell, it will sell or, uh, or obligate their, uh, citizens, it's their citizens, citizens to, to pay for. So only print money and only help in the short term. And there are many opportunities. I don't know, Bruy, I have to answer now because I think there will be a question about it. No. Uh, we'll address it a bit later. I want to uh, actually refer to Zohar now because uh, we heard some very harsh uh, um, estimations and, and assessment of what's happening today and what is going to happen in the very near future. And I would like to ask you, how, how can we best uh, um, actually deal with the stress of the public? Is the public stressed because of the health issue? Is it stress? because of the economic, the unemployment, or other things, and what can we do to actually alleviate this? Well, first of all, it's uh, both of the factors that you mentioned. Uh, public is stressed, if not almost traumatized, because of the health situation, because of the uncertainty, um, due to the fact that there is, um, as you all heard from uh, Nava, harsh economic situation. And there is another thing that uh, people tend to overlook. Normally, when we are uh, in a stress situation, uh, we can elicit two, two actions, fight or flight. But this is a kind of situation where we are forced not to do. In other words, we have to sit, to sit back and do nothing, which means that the stressful situation cannot be alleviated by, by the natural uh, response system that we have. So all of that uh, create a kind of uh, mixture, which is, uh, in, to say the least, is very unhealthy for all of us. Now, the other question that you ask is how to alleviate it. It's quite an issue. Now, I know that uh, the media, the, pap the papers, uh, and, and also the, the social webs are full of all kinds of advices. And I think, to a certain extent, all of them are valid. 
but uh, I think we have to go also beyond them and to have some kind of realization that uh, we are in a kind of a junction and the junction is either to go to succumb to our habits and get crazy or to really realize that we have another option and to choose it. And the other option is to play the, uh, um, the, adult, the uh, responsible adult. And, but I know that it is easy to say than done, but I think this is the, the very important option that we should choose. Thank you, Zohar. And uh, I want to take your words about um, be a responsible adult and how all of us should behave and how we can actually influence on the behavior. And I would like to refer to you, Gilly, and ask you, in that respect, what is the role of the media? And does the media help us to become the responsible adults or the other way around? We have to use uh, the media as, uh, as a tool in order to uh, uh, to do the, deliver, first of all, the information and to try to bring the public to be a part of uh, what we are doing. But I think we have quite a lot of challenges in which we have to deal with in order to achieve it. First of all, we have to gain the, the, the trust of the public. We have to have a coordination between all the organizations that deliver the information to the public. We have to deliver it in many languages. We have to be able to answer the call centers of and the calls of the public. We have to deal with the unknown situation for the public and for us, and to deliver a timely and accurate information, and to deal with uh, people with special needs, and to deal with uh, uh, the rumors. So in order to, to do all, whatever you, you said, we have to deal with all these challenges in order to be able to, to to share the information and really that the, the public will listen to us and do whatever we want them uh, to do. Thank you, Gilly. And you talked about uh, trust. We want the people to trust us. Mika, I would like to ask you a question that was um, actually asked by one of our uh, attendees, uh, uh, Jimmy, asking, um, can we actually uh, trust the information that we are getting? Uh, is it possible that we're not hearing the right numbers from different countries and this is the basis for making decisions? What is your opinion on that? Again, this is a difficult question because systems are different in different countries. I have worked in the People's Republic of China in an AIDS program. And uh, it was a whole floor and I had my office there and one floor below us was the tuberculosis uh, office, another floor. I walked down from the office where I was after issuing a request that all HIV positive people would be tested for TB. And I went to the TB people and said, why don't we test all the positive TBs for HIV? And the answer was information is a state secret. So whatever you hear from a place like China should be taken with a grain of salt. There are rumors of much higher numbers of fatalities, but it looks like that they have achieved control over the epicenter of the epidemic in Wuhan particularly and in Hubei province in general. They do have more cases. A lot of them are imported into the region and not really autochthonous from the place where the epidemic uh, occurred in the first place. And we should learn from their experience, no doubt, even if their numbers are incomplete. We should learn from their experience. There's nobody in the world so far who has really seen and gone through the clinical and the epidemiological issues of this epidemic like the people of Wuhan. Thank you, Mick. Um, Nava, I would like to uh, ask you a question that was raised um, before even our, uh, our webinar and during uh, the webinar, uh, asking, is it likely, and this is uh, also in light of your very um, severe uh, uh, forecast, which you relayed before, 
Is it likely that the COVID-19 will cause food security and actually impact on the livelihoods of the rural people or even people uh, that are residing in cities and, uh, and hunger may become a real problem? I'm afraid to give the answer. The answer is yes, yes. Because, uh, you know, uh, one of the conclusion of this crisis is that each country should, should, uh, be, uh, should be responsible to its own supply, to its own food supply. You can't trust import and exports without the world. It, it's what we know now, but it won't be forever and it won't be in the short run. Uh, I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the long run. So uh, people won't, won't have, maybe no, not have food and not have uh, any, any means to, to buy food. I'm afraid that uh, people will uh, be, there will be uh, food uh, scarcity. And I think that food security is one of the main issues uh, that we have to care, take care of. And now, just now, I remember the, the biblical story of uh, Joseph and its brothers. And in Egypt, they had a lot of wheat uh, supply, to, to uh, wheat supply that could help with the famine, with the famine. And now uh, we'll have to, to, to be sure that we have the uh, food. And also like we have, don't have now is the uh, products for, uh, me for uh, medical care that we don't have. It's like, now it's like food. So if we are, if we, there is scarcity of uh, medical products, why won't be a, a scarcity of uh, food? So, uh, but I think that the people will change their, uh, even their food uh, consumption and there will be ch high change, huge changes in uh, our uh, consumption of food, of services and of everything. So, so without the world, most, of peop most people uh, can be, will survive, but there will be even uh, needed a lot of education how to use uh, scarce uh, products in the future. It seems, it seems that we needed Joseph. Yeah, we need Joseph and Benjamin. Mick, you wanted to also relate to the hunger. I think the issue of scarcity of food <coughs> has to be classified by where you are in the world. Imagine a lockdown in India where people live, like they say in Hebrew, from hand to mouth. They provide themselves with enough money to go through the day, to buy food for the family for the day. Now imagine that they cannot go out of their dwelling for a week. There will be hunger right away, even if the production of wheat and corn will be changed from uh, animal fodder to making uh, loaves of uh, bread or spaghetti. Still, the poor in the developing, developing world will be the first to suffer hunger. Thank you, Mick. Zara, I would like to approach you with a question that has to actually deal with the connectivity between uh, the mental health and uh, uh, solidarity and the, the economic uh, uh, situation. And this was actually asked by one of the attendees, by, by Carlos. Um, he's asking, he's saying that he has uh, um, a, a business and they're actually under great uh, uh, pressure by the tenants that cannot pay their, their rent. Now, on the other hand, he also is suffering for a financial uh, uh, constraint. He wants to be understanding. He wants to uh, um, look at, at the solidarity towards the people that are finding it financially uh, uh, problematic, but he also has his own pressures. Then what would you say, is there an answer? Can we give any uh, help to such dilemmas? It's a very poor dilemma, but I think this dilemma belongs to the realm of uh, ethics and moral, and moral because it's, it, it, 
I'm not sure it is highly related to uh, mental health because um, in a situation like that, such, such moral dilemma uh, becomes more, more apparent, more present. Because uh, on the one hand, we want uh, to be compassionate. And on the other, uh, as uh, Nava uh, saying, I mean, Nava became our uh, raging prophet. Um, but uh, of course, she's, she's right. Uh, I mean, she's right in her approach. But when a situation of, uh, of starvation or, or scarcity of, of means, it, it, elicit, it elicits the, some kind of demons in our species as, as a whole species. And we cannot predict what uh, people might do in such situation. So You're mute. Zor, please unmute. So I Thank want you. to emphasize the, the issue of uh, morale. We are now obliged to have a very uh, big concern about where we want to put, our, put ourselves in terms of moral judgment. Thank you. Gilly, I would like you to also uh, relate to that uh, issue and taking it into uh, the risk communication and our um, utilizing, again, the, the messages that the media is, is providing to us all. How does that come into effect? And can we help with these moral ethical dilemmas by presenting uh, messaging through the communication means? It really depends the message that you want to deliver to the public because uh, it depends the country and where you are. Uh, of course, each country will deliver different uh, uh, messages and in a country will have different messages to different uh, people inside the, uh, the country. So it's, it's really a matter of, of uh, the messages that you want to deliver. Crisis communication is something that is supporting the disaster management. It doesn't come it doesn't come, you don't rule the, the, uh, the event by crisis communication. It's, it's only a tool. So you have to, to have the messages that are, rely, that are uh, relevant to the way you want to handle the, the crisis. So this is the, the way you, you do it. And of course, you will have different messages to different people in, in your country. Make, thank you, uh, uh, Gilly. And, and we're all discussing the, the different uh, ethical uh, dilemmas, and there are many more than what we have discussed. And I would like to uh, raise another um, both operational uh, issue, which is also uh, um, an ethical dilemma, is who do I provide? Who do I provide? Uh, Orit, can you please mute everyone? Thank you. Um, can you uh, relate to uh, who do we, in, in, in different countries, uh, who do we decide who will get uh, the ventilation machines, which is something which is greatly discussed. We, we saw some countries saying anyone over 60 years old will not uh, uh, be resuscitated, will not be ventilated. Other countries are still um, deliberating and discussing this. How can the medical as well as the social um, system relate to this issue and do you think there is uh, um, any, any, any type of, of help which we can, can provide in order to make such decisions? First of all, by the color of my beard, you can tell that I am high risk. I'm in a high risk group, no doubt. Now, in Britain, in the 70s of the 20th century, I'm not talking about the Middle Ages, you were not provided with treatment by hemodialysis if you were above the age of 60, period. I worked with one of the most religious Christians on earth who ran a small hospital in rural India. And he had a rule, if a baby is born less than a thousand grams of weight, the baby gets supportive treatment, but he's not put in, in, in an incubator because they don't have enough incubators. So this dilemma is not new. It is, has been with us and we had to deal with it. There's a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine written by the 
commander of the Israeli field hospital in Haiti. And he emphasized the importance of choosing patients whom you can help, who are salvageable. So what I would suggest is strengthening the ethics committees of hospitals who have to help the hospital management to make tough decisions and add representatives of the community so that at least the community feels that it is involved in these terrible but necessary decisions. It's not hard to be in the seat where you make those decisions. Um, Nava, I would like to uh, refer, there are several questions asked by the attendees concerning specifically the uh, tourism um, area. And people are wondering if it will be able, it will be possible to actually uh, um, rehabilitate or, or restore tourism to what it uh, uh, was or will people not have money or not have the inclination to continue to travel. Can you uh, give some uh, forecast or, or some comments on that uh, area? Uh, I think that uh, that it is, you know, it's it's a short crisis. It won't take uh, ten uh, years like uh, the big uh, the big crisis of nine of uh, nineteen twenty two. It will take. I I don't say I don't know time. It won't take as long as time. And I think that uh, people mem uh, people's memory is short and they like uh, to have good uh, things. And when the world be will become uh, more secure, I think uh, people will go around and go on with this. People who, could, who can afford themselves. And now when, uh, when I, all people will need this uh, consumption. Uh, what I think now that government should uh, substitute the, 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 the flight companies because they are very, very important uh, issue in the future, uh, in this future. So I think now that I mean, Israeli, our government should help uh, El Al or any other flight companies uh, to survive because uh, it will be needed later on, and it is a very important uh, resource for uh, people uh, good, for people, for, for further globalization and going through the world. Thank you uh, for giving some hope and something uh, positive uh, concerning uh, what we're facing. I would actually like, because we've been talking about so many concerns, uh, before we proceed, I would like to uh, approach our attendees and ask you, and we will do so again in a poll, what is your major concern concerning the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis? Orit, can you uh, please put the question on the screen? Orit, can you please put the second question so that we can uh, vote on what is the... Yes, I, I just I just I just launched them. One second. Um, okay, thank you. Let's just try it again. Can everyone see? Yes. Thank Great. you. So we have access to testing, risk communication, mortality and morbidity, mental health and social resilience, or economic consequences. Yes. So there. We're almost halfway there. So far, economic consequences seems to be the uh, the the most popular one. The major concern. Yes, we're almost there. Okay, Can you, uh, uh, let's present end. the results. Yes, I know. Here we go. Share. Okay, so forty-eight percent. Um, believe that the major uh, concern are actually the economic uh, consequences. So I would like now uh, to present a questions and any of our panelists that would like to uh, refer to that, that would be uh, uh, great. Is there's a question that uh, has been raised by many of our uh, attendees concerning the responsibility of uh, the, the high uh, income countries in relation to low or low mid-income uh, uh, countries. What 
is going to be the responsibility of, of the stronger economies in the world concerning uh, any help or um, restoration that will be needed in uh, less fortunate or less strong uh, economies worldwide. Who would like to go first? Mick, please go ahead. I think that human nature hasn't changed. And I think that uh, solidarity between countries is not altruistic. We will, have, we will need a very strong incentive for the haves to help the have-nots. And it is the responsibility of international organizations to try and stimulate us to do so, because just out of goodwill, it will not emerge. Okay, Nava, you wanted to also relate to that? No, you need to unmute. Nava? Okay, okay. Uh, I am sorry that I, I, I feel that because of, of me, you, you are so much uh, afraid of the economic consequences. So I'm sorry. I begin by a small joke. <laughs> uh, small joke. It's better to be healthy and rich than uh, sick and uh, poor. So <laughs> if, you, if you can choose, so choose the right side. But it was a joke. Uh, I think that the nature of people and the nature of uh, countries is, first of all, to take care of their own uh, people, of their own citizens. And we can see now uh, regarding, uh, regarding uh, a medical, uh, medical products, how there is a war in the world. There is a war in the world. Everyone needs it for its uh, own. Uh, we are... We are, uh, regu we are used to trust on, US, on United States, uh, and I don't think she will be, this country will be strong after this crisis. Maybe China will be stronger than United States, we don't know. So I don't think there is a country that we, we can trust. In Europe, there are many problems because of uh, now many problems, and we saw uh, that Britain we got out of uh, got out of the European uh, market, and so uh, I think the now separation will be much more than uh, than uh, United uh, United efforts. Um, I'm I don't know even the what will be in Europe and what will be in the world, uh, I, but uh, there will be a problem to have one uh, country or one president who will guide the world. And I hope that after each crisis, there will be some uh, cooperation, uh, which won't be very easy to do. Thank you, Nava. Zohar, you wanted to relate, but please unmute yourself. Yeah, mm, I want to say that uh, such a situation is an opportunity or, or the precious time for upstanding politicians. We used to not to trust politicians as a whole, but this is the time, as said before, that uh, some brave and courageous politician will arrive, will emerge out of this mud, and perhaps can, uh, uh, can lead different ways and different approaches. So uh, against our very nature, solidarity and altruism, and also not a very narrow interest thinking will prevail in such a time. Uh, let's hope that, uh, this, the, that history or the present will, uh, will uh, allow such a an appearance uh, to become true. Thank you. And Gilly, I thought you also wanted to relate to that? I think there are many reasons why uh, uh, countries will want to support. It's true that there will be less money, but there are other reasons in which uh, uh, countries want to support. Some are politics uh, uh, issues. Some are ROI uh, reasons, and there are other uh, ways 
to support and not only donation of money. So I, I believe that there will be less money in the beginning, but countries will want to have influence in other places. So I think that you will see support, but you will see less money uh, uh, donated by the big, the big countries that are donating the money. Thank you, which means that it will not only be up to the countries and so on, the philanthropic uh, world, and each one of us as individuals will probably have the chance to uh, make uh, an impact, uh, small or large. I would like to uh, raise some additional uh, aspects that we haven't discussed as yet. And I would like to ask you, uh, Zohar, this is a question that was raised by uh, Fuzia. Uh, she wanted to ask you that considering this overwhelming situations with people that had the uh, precedent uh, mental health issues even before the COVID-19, do you think that they are now becoming more vulnerable due to their uh, um, situations before and their immunity system, does that uh, uh, make them more vulnerable to be ill now? I want to say that uh, the only answer that is possible is a very general one. We know the relationship between um, our mental health situation and the immunity system. However, not everyone uh, is affected in the same way on the one hand, and also it is very interesting to see that uh, the Im immunity system is highly affected by severe stressful situation and all, on not all the spectrum of, of psychopathology. So I'm not sure, as we need to know what kind of psychopathology is at stake, uh, I'm not sure that any psychopathology or previous history will affect the same way um, the, the immunity system. And even, even that, we have to be very cautious because although we establish some relationship, it is very individually uh, uh, affected. Right. And I to add, yes, go ahead, Gillian. I just want to add that uh, the risk communication is an important tool in order to support the public. Uh, usually we say what to do, how to do, and why to do things, but we also have to support the public uh, to give them the tools how to overcome the situation. And by that, by supporting the people, we can lower uh, these uh, uh, things to happen. Uh, thank you, Gillian. I wanna continue with the issue of, of communication, but it's not only us that are controlling uh, uh, the media. We also have, um, we know the, the uh, new media and varied uh, channels that we're using. And we have seen throughout this crisis also rumors, fake news that also have an impact. So I would like to ask you, how do they actually impact? And is there anything that we can do and how we can uh, cope with that in order to make sure that there is uh, um, uh, information that is uh, accurate getting to the people and influencing them as we would like? First of all, uh, we can say that uh, uh, the rumor spreads faster even than the, this virus, and this is something that we saw. And when uh, you don't have the information delivered on the right time uh, to the public, and if they don't have trust, they will look for other places for the information. So we saw during this, I think, uh, uh, during this uh, uh, crisis, uh, we saw several, uh, uh, several misinformation that was delivered to the public. Most of them was uh, uh, kinds of uh, theories, conspiracy theories. Some were uh, uh, dealing with uh, ways how to cure the public, for example, to drink uh, uh, bleach. Uh, some were related, related to uh, a vaccine and to protective, uh, uh, personal protective masks, uh, which can be uh, used. Uh, but on the other hand, I think we saw quite a lot of good solution that were used during this uh, crisis around the world. So as I said before, first of all, we have to uh, build the trust of the public. The second thing was uh, uh, really to give the tools to the public, to educate the public to understand what could be a rumor. And if you think that it's a rumor, please look for information in the right resources, go to the WHO, or go to the, Med uh, to the Ministry of Health, etc. And another thing was to really to monitor 
uh, the new media and to see if there are all kinds of rumors. Uh, a lot have been done with working with the big uh, players like Facebook, Twitter, etc. And they are really uh, uh, trying to, to kill uh, rumors when they are small and really to tell the public to look for information uh, in the big places like the Ministry of Health. And uh, uh, of course, working with the media by delivering them the information on the right time so the public will receive it. So in order to fight the new media, we have to, uh, the rumors, we have to be rapid, relevant, and accurate in order really uh, to, to fight the rumors, but we have all the time rumors and we have to fight it all the time. Thank you, Gilly. And, and Gilly, related to the, I, I'm coming to you, Mick, but I would like to pose a question and then you can also refer to what you wanted to. Um, Gilly spoke about the need to be rapid, to manage, to, to actually uh, coordinate the response. And I would like to ask you, who actually should manage uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis? Is it medical personnel or is it something which is much wider? Is it politicians? Is it economic uh, personnel? We heard uh, from Nava. What is your opinion? Who should actually manage this situation? First of all, uh, I think we should switch the term rumors to the term fake news. Rumors are spread because of uh, malice. Fake news are spread with a very clear agenda. And there is plenty of those around, uh, including uh, elections, including uh, smearing of people. There's a lot of uh, really fake news. Um, the only way to fight these is by giving facts, by telling them, telling the people what is going on, what is true, and what is false. Now, the conspiracy theories have really a very wide base because of uncertainty. And uncertainty is the mother of anxiety, and anxiety is the mother of mass hysteria. And this is something we need to fight, for example, by telling the world that all the epidemics so far have died out a natural death with our help or without our help. In this case, we can hope for a vaccine and we can hope for widespread immunity before we have vaccine, what we call herd immunity, which will make transmission less likely. The virus will have no susceptible people, not enough susceptible people to attack and then the exponential curve turns over and becomes exponential by going down. I, I want to relate, Roya, to your question, who should uh, lead such a situation, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is some of the thing that we emphasize in our program for a management disaster. Because emergency and disaster, disaster situations are, are by definition an example of complexity. And cl complex situations demand a team, a, multi, a multidisciplinary team. And I know that uh, normally um, not all governments and not all people who deal with it actually have in mind the, the potential of getting the, um, the right uh, managing when you have a really interdisciplinary team coming from all over realms, coming from, even from uh, realms that, that we mentioned today, even philosoph uh, uh, philosophers of ethics, as well as mathematicians and some other that are not seemingly related to the situation. The, the answer, the, the solution lies within this kind of large brain of people coming from various disciplines knowing how to work together. And I think, in a way, this is one of the things that we emphasize in our program, that uh, our, all our teamwork is a kind of example for this specific goal. Thank you. And this is a very important message that goes to uh, almost everything that we do in disaster management is working together and, and collaborating. 
I would like to raise uh, another question that was raised by Alice, one of our attendees from, from Italy, which is a country which is very highly impacted um, by, by the COVID-19. Uh, and, and she's asking, and this is also mixed that these are hard questions. Well, this is another hard question. Is the lack of preparedness of, of strategic uh, planning the main problem? She's speaking uh, about Italy, but I think this is a much larger uh, and wider uh, questions, or is it actually a, a lack of strong leadership and clear communication to uh, uh, the citizens? So uh, I'm, invite, uh, I'm inviting any of the panelists who would like to actually relate to that. Is it preparedness? Is it leadership and communication? Who would like to go first? Go ahead, Zohar. Well, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question. And I think it's in another example of what uh, I just said before. It actually, it's not either or. The, mo the most important aspect here is about preparedness because we know that although there were uh, information about that, that such a, 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 a pandemic could emerge, uh, not enough preparedness uh, was made uh, prior to this situation. And one of the things of Anyone who wants to deal with disaster, we know that the major aspect of it is preparedness. But there is a problem with it, because when everything is, fi is fine, there are only very small number of people who can, within, when the sunshine is fine, can think of, of uh, days where it will be storms. So one thing is preparedness, but of course the other is about uh, leadership and communication. Actually, the question, her question is just another example that it's about not either or. It's a multi-level uh, aspect and demands multi-level thinking, which normally people tend to overlook. Really? You wanted to say something? I think it's uh, something that we are dealing with a lot in our program and this is first of all the preparedness is very important but sometimes it's not enough so we have to uh, to deal with the consequences when something happens and of course when you have it you have to take the decisions and sometimes when you want to take the right decision and you wait to have all the information sometimes it's too late so sometimes we have to take the decisions when we don't know everything and this is the situation with this event, which you have to take decisions even before you know what really will happen. And uh, I think that it's a combination of all the three things that you, you, you raised before. Thank you very much. Yes, Moran, go ahead. I think, well, since uh, this is one of the, the fields I study most, um, it's, it's uh, I think, a common thing for human beings to procrastinate and to uh, delay anything that has to do with emergency preparedness. We just don't want to deal on a daily basis with emergency management. The people sitting in this webinar, as well as the people attending this webinar, are very much interested in, uh, in emergency management, and they are keen on understanding how we can promote preparedness in uh, coordination between uh, organization, countries, et cetera. But for most people, it's really an issue that they prefer either to not discuss on a regular basis or just postpone to when the threat becomes real and imminent, uh, which is often too late. And the thing is that we as disaster managers, uh, we have a very limited attention span from decision makers and politicians and having their uh, attention during routine time when there is there is no backing from uh, public uh, to deal with emergency management that makes it that much more difficult to convince uh, those decision makers and politicians to invest time money effort and people into uh, creating those uh, plans and coordination it's it's so it's so difficult to do so and then when we are faced with uh, such an emergency or disaster, that is when people start to ask, well, why weren't you prepared for this? Why didn't you uh, take the time to consider, plan, write protocols, et cetera, et cetera. It's always on an ad hoc basis, always when it's a little bit too late. Thank you. And this is why we believe that it's so important to study the field of disaster management to raise more and more uh, uh, awareness. Uh, Nava, you wanted to relate to that too? 
you need to unmute. Nava, you need to unmute. Okay. I want to relate it from an economic point of view, and this is a crucial problem. Uh, when you estimate the benefit cost value of prevention, it's huge. It comes between at least four to eight to, eight to 10 times each dollar that you, that you invest in prevention uh, brings about uh, ten dollars, about ten dollars in a, in a, in a, in less damage. So it's very very important and it's very economic. But the problem, as my as other people said, is that you can't show you can't show what you prevent. You can't say, oh, I prevented the corona. I prevented uh, fifty fifty uh, deaths or. 100 days or so on. So there is a lot of apathy about uh, this problem. And uh, it's one, it's the, I think it's the big uh, uh, issue of this program to show that from all points of view that you, that you take, you have to think before then to cry after, afterwards. And for this, you have to make economic analysis and uh, medical uh, and medical uh, programs and communication, all the areas and risk assessment, all the areas that we discuss to show this importance and to make this co uh, computation in order to bring it to decision uh, to decision maker uh, mind and to the public. So I hope that after this uh, crisis improves or I don't know, uh, will change our ways of thinking about the future crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Nava. And uh, I have to say that there are many more questions that have been uh, submitted. Uh, many more, unfortunately, there will be an answer in the time frame uh, that we had because we have uh, um, almost reached our time limit uh, for this uh, uh, webinar. But I want, before we um, say the concluding words, I want to ask you, Nava, because you uh, gave us the forecast, which is certainly uh, a realistic but very severe, I want us to actually relate to opportunities. Uh, we, we say that each uh, crisis is not only a crisis, it's only um, uh, also enabling us to, to, um, to, to take it, to seize it as an opportunity. And I want to ask you if you see any opportunity in this, and, and I'll just one, one more complimentary comment, uh, which came from one of our attendees, which asked, for example, could it be that because of all of the fears of our immune systems and what happened with the COVID-19, will the uh, natural herbal food now be uh, um, enhanced business? Of course, of course. Yeah. Sorry, I'm coming to... You're okay? We hear yeah. you well. Okay, because I don't see you, but it's okay. It's okay. Okay. Uh, I think it's uh, each crisis has its own advantages and disadvantages. And I think that there are many, many opportunities for, for, for uh, the public, for the government. Most of, first of all, for the environment. I think that the, the big gainer of this crisis is the environment that now faces less and less uh, air pollution. And uh, there is hope that there will be less global warming and less pollution because people will change the way that I, they think and see. I also think that I'm not, now I'm, uh, I'm on the head of economist, but I think that on personal view, each of, one, each of us will look at different at his, at his family, at his friends and at his life. But now I go to the to economic. Of course, there is now a immune, immune system, immune system is very important. And like preventing, uh, like preventing uh, disasters, we, we can uh, prevent uh, health issues. Instead of just uh, looking at medicines, we have to put more, much more on prevention. Prevention is in uh, everywhere. In, in health, in disaster, in, in family co communication, in social communication. So let's take best, better care, uh, care of us. So there is, there is uh, many opportunities for herbals, for alternative health, 
And also, as we see now, we are talking from remote, remote, a lot of opportunities for technology, technology and services for remote business conclusion. A lot of opportunities for, uh, for marketing networks of food, hygienic stuff, and other one. We see that we can stay at home and bring our words. Now we are united. There are about 1,000 people here from all the world, and we talk to them. I, I, I'm only sorry that they can see me and I can't see, see them. But you see, it's a huge, and this the corona brought us. The corona brought us to talk, to see each other from abroad, from abroad for, for remote distance. And also, I hope that uh, regular medicine will, will now, as Israel, you know, put a lot on security. But now, till now, security is only aeroplanes and tanks and so on. Uh, war. But now we, we understand the security is also a medi good medicine and good uh, food supply and so on. So there are a lot of opportunities for private, pe for private people, for, uh, for the public, for governments, and for the world. So I began with pessimism and now I am optimist. Well, thank optimist. you very much, uh, uh, Nava. And I think what we have learned what we have learned, uh, uh, Mick, just one second. I will give you uh, the mic in a minute. Um, I think what we have uh, all heard that uh, there's such a wealth of knowledge and this is a disaster management is a profession. We need to strengthen the profession. And just before uh, um, I will let uh, uh, Mick speak, I would like to pose a question to all our attendees. How many of you that are with us uh, right now are actually interested in furthering your, your study or your work in the realm of uh, disaster management. We invite you to very quickly respond to this. Yes, no, or not sure. Orit, can you share the opinions of our attendees with us? Yes, we have about 60% voted. Let's just wait for one more minute. Um, okay, so our results are 56% um, are interested and the rest are no or maybe. Okay, thank you very, very much. Mick, you wanted to um, respond. You wanted to say something? I want to give the example of Nepal. Nepal was in turmoil and had political difficulties no end. And then a major earthquake hit, which brought people back to their senses. And there was a political change, which carried with it a new attitude of dispersing responsibilities from the central government to local governments. And one of the results, and this is, the, this is a lacmus paper, this really tells you the truth. All of a sudden, all the power failures, which were a daily chore for Nepal, completely disappeared because of new management of the electric company. Unbelievable. So there is always hope that a disaster will shake things up, literally in Nepal, and bring on a change of attitude and a change of priorities. Wonderful, and it's wonderful uh, uh, to end in this uh, a more positive and hopeful uh, overview of what's uh, in store uh, uh, for us. I, I would like um, to uh, thank all of you for participating. You could see that there are many more questions that we had time to answer, and it just means that we need to have uh, uh, more collaborations, more sharing of information, more and more professionals coming to study the disaster preparedness and disaster management in order to have a body of, of people who can lead this uh, uh, important uh, uh, aspect of life, which makes all of us, all our societies, more uh, uh, resilient. Uh, the panel discussion and the active participation of, of all of you uh, attendees is part of the global struggle that we're all a part of to contain the coronavirus and, and hopefully get the uh, normalcy uh, uh, once again. 
Um, it's not surprising, it's actually expected that there are many more issues that concern or, or intrigued us and we're all required to continue in our joint strive to collectively uh, work together uh, in order to fight the coronavirus and empower our individual, our community, our national as well as international uh, resilience that uh, is important to all of us. I believe that we should not focus on any borders uh, between nations. You know, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 doesn't respect the borders, then why should we? What we should do is establish a very defined border between humanity and the virus uh, uh, populations. And we can only do that if we can uh, work together. I invite uh, any of you that are interested in becoming leaders in disaster uh, uh, management to join us, to join uh, uh, many other professionals, and specifically those of you who are interested in uh, furthering your academic uh, education, join us in our uh, uh, master's program. I believe that working together is something that will uh, uh, be able to make all our global community safer and more uh, uh, resilient. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, uh, Professor Mick Alkan, Professor Dava Echarovi, Mr. Uh, Gilishin R, Dr. Zoa Rubinstein, uh, Dr. Moran Bodas, and Reed from the uh, TU International. Those of you that are interested in contact us and, and ask us uh, um, additional questions, or Reed, can you put the slide on so that they can know how to contact us? And we will be uh, uh, more than happy to share with you um, any uh, insights and any information that is uh, uh, interesting to you so that we can continue the collaboration, not uh, stop it uh, here, but throughout this crisis and throughout uh, the next uh, uh, weeks, months, and, and years ahead. I would like to wish all of us safety, health, resilience, and good joint work in order to make our world a much better place to live in. Thank you, everyone, and have a safe day. Bye-bye.